Well, hello, everyone. I'm Steve Parker. We're here for another edition of Direct Connect. Um, notably absent is Stacy Bressler, who's our normal host for these things. Uh, he asked me to step in and uh, fill his his uh, his shoes or whatever metaphor you you want to use. Uh, I'll do my best. Uh, very happy to have with me today Nick Weber, one of the other Archer partners. And today we're going to talk about preparing for the unexpected. Did you expect that topic, Nick? Well, I'm not sure how to prepare for it, but We'll figure it out. That's the story of my career, I think. We will. Well, and, and it fits in with some of the topics we've had. You know, we, uh, one of our recent ones we did was on cyber war, uh, which probably fits into the category of unexpected. Although, to some extent, you can anticipate possibilities or potentialities, but you never really know the when and the where and the how and the, and, and the details of that. So that's one example. Um so I'm not sure, you know, where, where you want to begin, but I guess maybe I'll start by asking you, uh, in you know, in your world, the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis around NERC SIP and physical security and other things. What are some of those unexpected things that people might want to think about preparing for? I think the biggest ones are to to pull back from kind of the day-to-day, -day. and one of the, the, my favorite things to do, particularly when I was uh, when I was leading security the organization, was to to find the people who didn't do security every day and weren't necessarily on site every day and say, well, what would you do looking at this from somebody or an outsider? What are your perspectives? What are the things you think are weak or what do you think you think are strong from a security perspective or, or resilience and really get a lot of interesting and unique feedback. A lot of it was absolutely wrong, but it was good to know that's kind of the, the projection you're putting out there. But I would say a solid, 15 to 25% of the time got some really good ideas that none of us had thought of because we just walked past it every day. Um, those are kind of the, the pieces that I've used to look at that. Um, the other thing is, is take what you do expect and make sure you're really good at it. Um, so good that, that is muscle memory. Um, that was one of the things when I was a, a platoon leader in Iraq that we, we realized there was no way we could predict really anything that was going to happen but we knew we had about eight good battle drills, we called them, that everybody in the platoon knew inside and out. Um, just like tying your shoes. You knew what to expect from the left hand and, and, and the right foot, and you knew exactly what everybody was going to do from those eight things, and then just kind of riffed off of that. Um, so that was kind of how we did the unexpected and the, the things that weren't were out of the ordinary, and it, it worked really well. Um, just so, It also so, kind of so really, comfort space when... I mean, gen general pre general preparedness. How do you prepare for the unexpected? As you be ready for anything, in a sense, um, to the extent that that can be anticipated. Um, yeah. You know, I was just uh, you know just thinking and, and you're talking through, through this before we started up. But look at the last two years. You know, all the things that have happened in, in the last two years. Certainly, the pandemic was was clearly un unexpected, even though there had been discussions of the possibility of a pandemic. I know that organizations had had pandemic plans that they had at least half-heartedly put together, um, but nobody saw it coming, right? E even even when we knew COVID existed, we knew things were going on in China. There was stuff in Asia, and um, we weren't getting we're, we weren't getting a lot of. Oh, there's a lot of hey, it's going to be okay, no reason to worry. And then you know the the world ended. Um, any any takeaways that you've seen, uh, particularly you know in in physical security. A lot of things changed, right? The the way we worked and where we worked and all that. How did uh, that impact physical security? Um, honestly, I think we're we're still seeing it. There are some obvious ones. Um, the biggest one that I've seen just go around the utility space is trying to figure out where does the the responsibility to protect people where does that begin and end? Um, historically, when you go into an office, you say, you know what, when you hit the parking lot or wherever, you know, the property line from there in your corporate security is, is somewhat responsible for your, your safety and security. Um, honestly, the same thing with, with safety and ergonomics is a big thing for the offices. How do you manage that when somebody's working from home? Um, I, I heard a story of, of, or a couple stories of domestic violence and how do you manage that? Um, obviously we had plans for that in an office space. If, if somebody had a protective order or something to that effect, we knew about it generally and we put plans in place, but when they're at home, how do you do that? And 
I saw a lot of places get really forward leaning and say, okay, well, we can do tips. We can give advice on what kind of locks to put in and, and home security things to look for. Maybe not say, Hey, go out and buy this particular vendor, but say, make sure you can do these kind of things. Um, I know my old company, they actually sent out work from home packages for the ergonomics piece because it had been such a big um, safety issue for them. So a lot of the, there's a lot of those things that it really tend to turn things on their head. The interesting part was it, it opened people up to thinking of things in totally different ways. Um, that's cascaded across um, the organization. And it's interesting to see them come back to the office now. Folks, from every, everything from everybody come back to the office and we're going to go back to January 1st, 2020 to, hey, we found out you can work from home safe, secure, and effectively, so never come back. Yeah, it, it is interesting. I know back uh, in the earlier days of the pan- pandemic, a lot of people were theorizing that the offices would disappear, that this would be a permanent thing. And we've seen a little bit of that. We've also seen a lot of people getting back, um, uh, certainly from uh, – uh, outside the office perspective, I think people are realizing that they do need that social interaction. We're seeing the conference space heat up and things things come back come back that way. But there's definitely some permanent changes I think that came about as a result of the pandemic. Um, you know, other other things uh, on, on a personal note, out here in the Northwest, uh, you know, I, I live in Oregon as you know, and we've had uh, some natural disasters uh, go on, and certainly it's happened in other parts of the country as well. But just on a, on a personal level, we had uh, wildfires. Back in uh, 2020, uh, Labor Day weekend 2020, some of the worst wildfires that uh, had seen in the state of Oregon. And I got a firsthand taste of that because I was in an evacuation zone and our house was, uh, to say the fire, the, the, the flames were very near our house. Uh, uh, I've touched part of our property. So we had experience with, with evacuation. You know, we, we learned some lessons from that. A lot of things. Um, one, uh, you know, when the power goes out, we don't have a pump for the well. We can't use a hose to, you know, <laughs> try to keep the flames at bay. Um, my brother was on our property trying to help us clear some brush and realized that our chainsaw uh, was ready, but the blade wasn't sharp. So things things of that nature. Um, can you think of any examples, you know, maybe more directly relatable to security uh, of that nature where you maybe made assumptions about things that would be available that were not uh, under unexpected circumstances? I mean, that's one of the things you're always running into, and particularly in the physical security space, it seems like with cameras, um, it's always the one you need, that angle, when you're trying to assess an alarm that happens to go down for either communications failure or power failure or whatever it is. Um, so it's having that redundancy and knowing where you can get those different looks from. Also, just relying on, on infrastructure we take for granted every day. Um, that's one of the things when I was at Homeland Security, we actually kind of the the scenario i think broke fema because they expected that um power and electricity would would both be able to come back within a few hours or a few days and the reality is those two got into kind of a death spiral where if you lost connectivity and you couldn't communicate with the crews in the field they couldn't restore power but even the cell towers had at most 72 hours of, of battery backup so they they got into this situation where they couldn't figure out how to restart it because you couldn't communicate and you'd lost your repeaters for the radios. You'd lost the cell towers. Um, most of the, the communications network was down. So how do you move forward with that? Um, that's always an interesting when you start getting into the chicken and the egg, uh, particularly on the, the bigger disasters. How do you manage that piece? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And, and I know the the GridX report that was just issued last week, it's one of the things that NERC called out was the need for uh, uh, restoration of communications and doing some work in work in that area because it's it's critically important. Um, you know, making assumptions about what will or will not will not be available. And you mentioned communications. Uh, uh, another point uh, on a personal note. You know, we went through an ice storm uh, a year ago, February here in here in Oregon. It was the same week that Texas had their major cold outbreak event. So we did, we didn't get a whole lot of attention. But uh, you know, I was at our house. We were without power for 232 consecutive hours. And we learned a lot of lessons out of that. Um, you know, we have a generator, so we can do certain things. Um, you know, one of the things I learned is that uh, it's great if you can have water stored up and, and use water or grab water from the creek or something. But if your septic's not on the generator, uh, you know, we have a sand filter, the septic backs up. So we had to, re, you know, re-jury-rig things. 
um, communications. We lost internet. Our, our internet provider, uh, they were actually out uh, filling generators uh, trying to keep the internet up. Internet up. Uh, you mentioned the cell towers. They went down. Um, we were fortunate. In fact, our generator broke on day seven, and we had to go out and get a new generator. Uh, we were very fortunate. We were able to, to get a new generator locally. Lowe's had brought in a whole whole truckload of them, and we were able to drive around and get uh, gas and propane filled up. But you know, I realized having those contingencies, right? Um, relating that into the cyber perspective, you know, you gave some examples, but how many people have their uh, disaster recovery plan or, or recovery plans or whatever it may be on a drive somewhere? And if you can't get to that drive, uh, you could be in trouble, right? Do you have do you have paper printed copies? Do you have maybe copies on a on a USB? Uh, can you get to it? What if what if your authentication goes down? Lots and lots of things to think about. Yeah, I would say that the biggest one, if you're preparing for the unexpected, is communication. Um, if you have good communication, you can work through a lot of things. But without it, you're you're going to be dead in the water real quick. Um, and it doesn't matter what kind of emergency or what you're doing, physical security, cyber security emergency response um and the, the military we always had we called it pace your primary alternate contingency and emergency communication you always had to have a way to talk to somebody because if you you lost that communication you weren't of any value and your unit was going to come apart real quick i mean i think we're seeing a lot of that play out on the news right now in ukraine you can tell who can communicate and who can't that that's such a huge component whether you're um you're responding to a cyber attack or a, a physical incident or a wildfire or combat it doesn't matter if you can't talk you're not going to be able to to be that, that adjust on the fly the the semper gumby flexibility and if you can't communicate to folks what to expect and what's going on. Yeah, that can that can be very challenging. I know certainly in the cyber world we depend quite a bit on electronic communications, um, mm -hmm. and sometimes the redundancy is well we have another path out to the internet. Uh, there's an assumption that the internet is always going to be there, and most likely it will be, but to your point. Right, you can't necessarily rely on that 100% because it's it's quite possible that it it would go. Um, you know, your your home internet goes down, you have the cellular backup. But what happens when the cell sites go down? Right now, you're looking for a landline, or you're driving to some area where there is a cell coverage or something of that nature. So it can be it can be very challenging. Yeah, that's uh, one of the things I usually when I facilitate exercises, just start picking those assumptions. And, and oh, next inject that broke. That broke, that broke, and, and see how far they've gone down that rabbit hole. Um, usually in communications, it's only one or two steps, and there's a lot of assumptions that I think won't hold up in an actual emergency. Yeah. How, how far down that rabbit hole do you have to go? I mean, I mean, at some point, there's only so much you can do, right? How do you measure when you've done enough? Yeah, that's the, the tough part, and it honestly is going to be different for every, every organization. Um, how much are... What's your tolerance for, for risk on that? What's your tolerance for downtime? Um, do you hold your, your security communications the same level as your operators for the, for the bulk electric system? Do you, do you need to have sat phones for your security teams? Uh, it depends, honestly. That's something that every organization is going to have to look at and, and make a, a decision, but it should be something that's a conscious decision. This is where um, we're going to go into absolute, just we're going to figure it out mode not we think we're good and then find out a lot when the, the actual emergency is happening that you're not i think that's the important piece is, is making a conscious decision of where that enough is enough so a lot of this is probably um there's a uh you know design basis i guess for your for your con contingency plans right what's the worst case scenario are you are you prepping for uh you know a day without power a week without power a month without power are you looking at the loss of uh, the primary communications, primary and backup, all, all of those things? What kinds of scenarios, uh, you know, if you were going to uh, put together a contingency plan, what would some of those criteria be uh, in terms of timelines and extent of condition that you might consider? I guess one of the things I'd look at is, um, before I even got into that, what kind of, um, what would your staff do, what would your team do if they lost communication? Um, the more they're able to function um, with ambiguity, the less I'm concerned about that communication piece. Um, the stronger they are at knowing that if these X, Y, Z happens, this is how we treat that. 
the, the less important that communication gets. Um, if you've got a kind of a single threaded resource, as we used to call it, a, a lottery or bus sensitive situation where you have that one person who's driving everything, I would pull a lot harder on the communication piece than your ability to command and control if you really have that, that inability to operate decentralized. Um, so at that point, if you're completely taking all orders from the top, I would, I would probably look for three to four um, communication paths to call that effective. Um, and even then I would still come back to you, okay, the fourth one breaks. Now what? Does everybody sit around and, and wait until somebody drives up and tells them what to do? Or do they at least know some basic things to keep um, the team moving forward? Would that be a common thing? Um, I don't know that I've ever seen that in a in a contingency plan or recovery plan, but would it be common to have that? You know, in the event of a total loss of communications, you're flying blind. What is your uh, modus operandi in that case? You you know continue running as is, or do you shut down? Do you uh, how how do you operate? Honestly, I haven't seen that outside of the government much. I know when I was at DHS, we did have some of that. If you lose communication, go here do this um, um, same with the military we kind of had that if you were completely cut off here's what you do um, but I haven't seen that outside of those fears as much frankly because for better or worse mostly for better um, we haven't been put in that position um, one of those lessons you kind of learn the hard way but I, I have heard of a few who've gotten who discussed it I haven't seen it actually implemented them On the operation side I've definitely seen that where for whatever reason, if you're a, a hydro and you lose communication, you know what to do. You show up and you just keep working until somebody else relieves you. I know uh, we dealt with that a lot with winter storms. If you didn't get relieved, you stayed. Break out the sleeping bags and the rations. Mm -hmm. Figure it out. Um, keep the plant running and respond to frequency variations or something of that nature. Run run to frequency. Yep. I haven't seen it on security teams, but it's... I, wouldn't ex I would expect to see that when near future evolutions though I'm starting to get to that point particularly after covid um, mm -hmm. and the pandemic in in fairness if uh if communications are down then that means the the cyber risks have probably gone away or at least to some degree they've gone away because mm -hmm. it's uh you know, difficult to hack without the internet or some some sort of communications um yeah but that that whole preparedness angle i know i'm thinking through uh you know, me personally and my family, how, how we prepare for things. Uh, I always like to say, okay, what's the, you know, what's the worst case that we're going to prepare for, right? Um, and I'll joke about, you know, after after a certain point, you get into the Mad Max scenario and we're not going to prep for that, right? So you ought to be prepared, you know, to hunker down during a storm, a power outage, have food, supplies, things of that nature. Um, we've actually never thought through what if we lose communications, right? Is there a rally point, right? Or, if, you know, what if there's a major natural disaster and we're all scattered about? Um, back when, you know, before COVID, I was traveling a lot. I was out of town quite frequently. And um, I thought about it. I never really came up with a solution. But what would, what would happen if there was a major event and I was across the country and couldn't get home? Um, yeah. You know, what would, what would I do uh, when you're out on the road? I don't know if you have thoughts about that, but that's, you know, kind of a scary thought. What if you're in a, in a traveling, you're in a city, you've, maybe you don't have a lot of cash and suddenly there's a natural disaster. You've got no supplies. You've got no cash. Credit card machines aren't working. Um, I don't know what you do in that situation. We put, actually I had some, we had some of that in place when I lived in uh, Northern Virginia. I was working in Crystal City when the earthquake hit DC and the, the first thing that they did was shut down all the mass transit, which meant nobody got out of DC. Uh, and could the actual the way I got a hold of, of my wife and let her know I was okay was via Facebook through a friend in Seattle, and that was I had the goes card I had the I remember what it was but the, the cell phone priority thing everything mm -hmm. was was down um, my goes card didn't work my cell phone priority could, didn't work I couldn't get a signal but I got just enough to shoot a message out that I was okay and if anybody heard it let Sarah know that I was okay a friend in Seattle saw it let her know. But we came back after that and said, okay, what are we going to do? And we actually set three different rally points. And it was wait at the first one, which was a few blocks from our house. Uh, it was like an hour or until it's not safe. And then go to the next one. And that was like three to four hours. And the last one out was at a hotel about 50 miles out of town, out in the Shenandoah Valley. And it was wait three days. We actually had gone through all of that, but a little different when you're 
you working for Homeland Security at the time where that's all expected that you do all those things because it gets beat into your head every day and in the national yeah. capital where you are more of a, a target for some of those things. But honestly, that that's kind of fallen off since then. We haven't done that. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of the things I've learned being being prepared is uh, the diligence tends to go diminishes over time, right? You know, yeah. we had we had we had wildfires in Oregon, and the next summer everybody was very heightened alert around around fires. And this year, probably be a little bit less, and the year after a little bit, a little bit, yeah, a uh, little bit uh, less. So it, it does take energy and effort to to stay prepared, but it's it's certainly certainly worth doing. Any other uh, any other thoughts and comments on this topic? No, I think the biggest thing is, it's, it can't, obviously, you can't expect the unexpected, but you can start to think through what are those basic tenets you're going to need to respond to just about anything. Try to stay as current on those as you can, um, whether that's making sure everybody knows what to do in the event of certain event, certain components, um, have some somewhat templated responses to the security incidents you can expect, whether they're physical or cyber um, Make sure you have those backup communication plans and you can get to those plans or you can get to your recovery and response plans, as you pointed out. Those are, they're all little things, but kind of the, the little things what make up the big things. Yeah, I think I'll ask, uh, you know, rhetorically, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? And and that's a question we probably all need to be asking ourselves. What's the worst thing that can happen? I don't know if we want to, <laughs> I'm afraid to answer that after the last two years. So it's just... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But thinking, think through ways to, to, to be ready. And uh, I know we focus a lot on uh, kind of, you know, phys- the physical world and natural disasters, but I think a lot of takeaways uh, in the virtual world, the electronic world, the world of cybersecurity, the world of compliance, uh, challenge your assumptions. Uh, think of, you know, try to think outside the box on things that uh, could happen are in the realm of possibility that you haven't considered. And, uh Always be trying to improve your position. If you're if you're working to improve, you will not be going backwards at a minimum. Hopefully. Um, mm-hmm. All right, good good discussion. Thanks, Nick, for uh, for joining me on this topic yeah. on uh, a relatively short notice. I think it was a, little, a good practice, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to uh, g- go into a discussion on this with with minimal preparation. Um, but I appreciate you being here and chatting with us. And uh, if anyone has any any questions on this topic, or further comments, ideas, thoughts, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again in a future edition of Direct Connect. Thank you. Stay up to date on all the videos we release here at Archer by clicking on the subscribe button. Click on the bell to be notified right away when we release new videos. If you know of a topic or someone you think we should talk to on Direct Connect, please let us know in the comments below.